All right, we are live. We want to ask several questions today. Is there another gospel that is being proclaimed? What about the topic of deconstructionism? Is it wrong for Christians to believe in a literal place called hell? Well, today we have a special guest, Elisa Childers. You might have remembered her. She was a popular musician and singer for the band Zoe Girl, but her YouTube channel now has a huge following. And you've probably seen her answering your questions on apologetics. She is the author of the book, Another Gospel, a fantastic book. Elisa, great to have you on the show. Hey, Dave, good to be with you. We were we were together a few years ago in Dallas at the Cross-Examined Instructor Academy, and it's great to see you coming onto this YouTube platform. I noticed that our, our backgrounds have some similar Wow, channeling. I just noticed notice that, that for the first time. <laughs> well, I need to get some type of like, uh, you know, logo in the back for mine as well, because yeah. uh, and, and learn from you as well. That was a great conference. I know Frank Turk just has a great team and you had a lot of good tips about communication. And um, that was just a great time. And my wife was there too, uh, Michelle. And so we were dating at the time and just got married back in uh, August. So that was good. Maybe you could just tell our audience a little bit about your story. Your father was kind of a trailblazer for the Christian music uh, industry, and you grew up a Christian. But tell us a little bit about your story, just growing up, your faith journey, but then a moment of doubt that you had as an adult. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, my dad traveled all over the country and even in certain parts of the world singing his Jesus songs. He and a bunch of friends uh, became Christians during the Jesus People movement revival that was happening in the late 60s, early 70s. And so I think one element of my story that's relevant to doubt is that my dad was a first generation Christian. So he didn't have a bunch of baggage from having grown up in the evangelical church or um, he, he just didn't have any preconceived ideas. So for him coming out of Eastern mysticism and Buddhism and even trying to find God through psychedelic drugs, uh, he just had this very uh, simplistic, very real and authentic view of what it was to be a Christian. And both my parents really modeled that for me. And I've been a Christian as long as I can remember. I don't remember a time when I wasn't aware of the presence of Jesus or I wasn't totally convinced the Bible was his word. But I think because I had a general, I guess, a generally positive experience with Christianity, I didn't really have reasons to doubt it intellectually. So I didn't realize growing up how weak the intellectual foundation of my faith was. And I want to distinguish, though, carefully, because it wasn't a blind faith. I don't think I had a blind faith. I had a faith that was informed by a lot of things, but it just intellectually was weak, and it wasn't, yes. had never really been through a test intellectually. So, yeah, fast forward, I was a part of the Christian music group Zoe Girl for several years in the mid-90s. And after that was over, we were all married with new, we were starting to have kids. And so I had this new baby and my husband and I started attending a church in Tennessee. And this was marketed as a non-denominational evangelical church. And we loved it. It was just great. And so after several months, the pastor invited me to be a part of a smaller type study and discussion group. And it was in the context of that class that everything that I believed virtually about God, Jesus, and the Bible was picked apart and explained away. And many people in the class ended up discarding most of those, what I would consider to be core beliefs of the Christian faith. And so I would try to debate with him. I wasn't very good at it. But after we left the church, after a few months, um, all of those doubts began to take root in my own heart and grow. And it just threw me into a crisis of faith. And um, so thankful to God for his faithfulness, for shepherding me through that process to help rebuild my faith. And a huge part of that was discovering uh, the discipline of apologetics. I didn't really know what that was. And I was just, uh, it was just an a really joyful experience discovering all this evidence that I didn't even know was there for my faith. What was that first like? You go into the church and it seems Christian. They're singing worship songs. They're talking about Jesus. Was it a shock to you when you went into that small group? And what do you remember what book he was using? Was it like some of the emergent church? Was it 
Brian McLaren or um, do you remember what book? Yeah, there. Uh, well, there were several books that we would read through and discuss. And yeah, you're right. I mean, we, I remember, I have a very distinct memory of one Easter at that church singing in Christ alone with the full verse that says wow. uh, on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. We sang that on Sunday wow. morning, but then on these Wednesdays, they're talking about the atonement, like it's cosmic child abuse. And so it was very, very destabilizing. It was very confusing. And so, yeah, one of the, I, I think maybe the first book that we read together was Brian McLaren's A Generous Orthodoxy. So this was back when the emergent church was really blossoming in America, yeah. the, you know, the, the mid 2000s ish, this was probably 2008, 2000, well, probably 2009 or 10. I'm terrible with math and timelines. I remember that. We tried to reconstruct it with my publishing team to make sure that the time, so I think it was 2009 because my daughter was born in 2008. And yeah, we read Generous Orthodoxy. And I remember it just being so confusing because there was a lot in the book I agreed with. There was right. a lot of the heart toward other people that I resonated with. My parents had always instilled that in me, feeding the poor, taking care of people, showing love to people. But there seemed to be this conflation in that book of what we would consider to be those core essential doctrines of the faith, which really is the impetus for which, you know, is the reason why we show love to other people and why we want to share the love of Jesus so they can be saved too. Um, there was a conflation of that with sort of this modern cultural definition of love being this all-inclusive, all-affirming type mm -hmm. of scenario. And so it's very love. confusing. Yeah. Yes, the whole Rob Bell. What You mentioned that around this time you were introduced to apologetics. What was it? Was it a friend who gave you a book? Did you just stumble across some searches? What was that like? Who were some of the people that inspired you in your journey towards truth? Yeah, well, I didn't discover apologetics until I was already out of the class and away from the church. And some time had actually gone by because I was sort of deconstructing. My faith was deconstructing. And I didn't know that word yet. I didn't understand what was happening mm -hmm. to me at the time. But I just remember crying out to God one night and saying, and, and honestly, I didn't even think anybody was listening. It was just, God, if you if you exist, if you're real, please show up. Please send me somebody who can talk to me about these things. Because I, I mean, I was so naive. I actually thought this pastor thought of all these objections. I thought, oh boy, like this guy has really thought of some stuff that's really challenging to the Christian faith. I didn't realize that that these had all been being discussed and debated and answered for 2000 years. Right. And so uh, God answered that prayer. Uh, I, I remember framing it like a lifeboat, like I need a lifeboat, God, because I yeah. feel like I'm drowning in these doubts. If you're real, if you exist, you got to send that lifeboat. And so I just remember um, I was in my car one day and I was flipping through the radio and I heard this, this voice on the radio at a college campus and he was answering all the questions from the skeptical college students. And almost wow. all of the questions he was answering were the questions we had discussed in this class. And so um, that, that voice was Ravi Zacharias, which of course, you know, I had to years later when that whole scandal broke and everything, I had sure. to work my way through, through that. Um, but ultimately landing on, I didn't put my faith in Ravi Zacharias when I became a Christian, I put my faith mm -hmm. in Jesus mm -hmm. and the words that he spoke were true words. And so, yes. um, Anyway, so through that, I discovered Southern Evangelical Seminary, Frank Turek, people like J. Warner Wallace, Greg Kokel mm -hmm. from Santa Reason. And so listening to podcasts and reading books and then kind of diving even deeper into the more scholarly books, auditing classes really helped uh, to rebuild my faith and bring me out on the other side, knowing not just that I have some good reasons to kind of skate by and say, okay, I think, you know, I'm, I can reasonably believe this, but really being persuaded that the Christian worldview is just a mountain of evidence in favor of it. And it's the best explanation of reality. Well, let's, let's get into some of those. You mentioned earlier, the whole issue of deconstructionism. And there's been, I remember, I think I might've, uh, was Zoe girl, were you singing uh, like in the early 2000s? Were y'all still together then? Yeah, we started in 99 and we okay. ended somewhere around 2000, 2007 or 8. So, yeah. Okay, because I think during that whole time, I was an intern for Josh McDowell. I traveled with Liberty University. I traveled a year with him, uh, with Josh, and we were at these big events and there was, you know, Toby Mac there and uh, Kirk Franklin and all these speakers and, I mean, singers and John Piper and and I believe 
you all were there as well. And uh, but I remember meeting Joshua Harris, and we look back. Some of those names like Joshua Harris, uh, best-selling author. Some of these musicians, some that you know of, have embraced this deconstructionism and have walked away from the faith. Tell us a little bit about what that term deconstructionism means and how should we respond to it as well? It's kind of trendy. Mm -hmm. It is trending. It's, I mean, that's really putting it mildly. It's actually, I, I really think you can make a case that it's an organized movement at this point. If you search the uh, hashtag deconstruction on Instagram or Facebook, you are going to find uh, lots of platforms that seem to be sort of moving together, doing conferences together. You can pay money to have someone walk you through a faith deconstruction. So this is something that's really, really popular right now. And if you would have asked me what deconstruction is uh, maybe a couple of years ago, I would have said, well, it's when you kind of doubt what you believe and then you want to figure out what's true and you discard what's not true and hold on to what is true. Right. I actually don't think that's the right definition now that we're seeing this movement take form. And it, it is, I mean, it's happening in real time. I mean, it's, it's something that's changing quickly. I, I actually think for that, I would rather use the word reformation or even examination or something along those lines that really indicates that you're looking for truth. Because yeah. I think overall, and I'm not speaking for everybody in the deconstruction movement, but overall, as I've studied it, as I've listened to deconstruction stories, it's really not about finding out what's true. In deconstruction, it's about finding out what you maybe agree with inherently or what you think is inherently good about a certain set of beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I think it's really postmodern in right. that it's kind of built upon this, this um, definition of the nature of truth that would be more on the side of relativism. What's true for you is true for you, but what's true for me is true for me. Let's find what works for ourselves and, and that not judge each other uh, as far as what we find works in, for spirituality and, and whatever else. And yeah, so I think you're exactly that, right yeah. in that, because I mean, I think, I mean, would you maybe compare it even to this, that it was a philosophy. I remember back in 2005 when I was studying under Geisler, we had a course on apologetics and I chose to write a paper on the whole, um, you know, emergent church, Tony Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, you know, some of those names you mentioned, Rob Bell, Brian McLaren, who were so popular, best-selling books back in 2005. But we were also reading the influence in the literature departments of Jacques Derrida. And yeah. I remember, according to Derrida, I mean, this is just on Wikipedia, what Derrida was doing, uh, it says that he wanted to turn away from the Platonic Plato Aristotle, who believed that there was an extra mental reality, that there was objective truth that we could know. And they shifted the emphasis to appearances, mm -hmm. to language, what the emphasis of mere appearances of language. Mm -hmm. And I think you're spot on there. Like, I think a lot of people, like pastors who talk about deconstructionism, they kind of use it in a way of maybe uh, examination, but they don't really mean yeah. it in the philosophy. Like it's neutral. It. I think true? a lot of, yeah, a lot of people think it's neutral. Yes. You know, deconstruction is just this neutral thing where you can filter. I actually don't think it's neutral. I think I actually made a video about this on my channel um, asking the question, is there such a thing really as good deconstruction? Because you see mm -hmm. that a lot, even among, um, I think, well-meaning church leaders and Christian thought leaders. They'll say, well, no, it's OK. Yeah, deconstruct the bad stuff. And I probably if you look back through my videos, I probably said something like that, you know, so yeah. no judgment here. Yeah. But as I as I grow in my understanding of what is actually happening, I think you're right. I, of course, you know, with Derrida, he's he's credited as being the father of deconstructionism. Um, I know that I understand that when people are saying it in a spiritual sense today, they're not exactly saying what Derrida was doing. But you're right. Derrida's approach to language and words was that he didn't think words could be pinned down to singular meanings. And so really the, the communicator had no more um, claim to say what was meaningful about the words that were being said than the person receiving them and interpreting them themselves. Um, and so you see that. You see that in biblical interpretation. It's in the deconstruction movement. It's the, the words are very, they're lowered 
right? So it's not even really about what was initially meant to be communicated. It's what can God speak to you now using some of those words? Or And, you know, of course, uh, people in the deconstruction movement aren't even going to view the Bible as any in, mean, in any meaningful sense um, authoritative or, or certainly yes. not inerrant. So there's that. But yeah, I think it's this, this breaking down of words, because if you talk to people in the progressive Christian movement, for example, who have maybe discarded some of these core doctrines, they might still even use some of those words. I've heard progressive Christians use words like incarnation, but they're not talking about G God in flesh, Jesus becoming right. flesh and living a perfect sinless life. They might be talking about creation, you know, God incarnating himself into physical matter, much like a hand would fill a glove and then is somehow um, contained within objects in the universe or that there's this uh, oneness, this sense of uh, the, the divine and everything. That's a whole, whole yeah. lot different than what Christians have historically meant by the word incarnation. So you definitely so, see that. So Lisa here, like there's a lot of people who have maybe grown up in a fundamental church, or maybe they grew up in say a mega church. There's a lot of people who grew up in mega church and now they look back and they think there's doubts. They don't know what is true you're saying that you wouldn't use deconstruction as a method, just probably like we probably wouldn't want to use CRT or Marxism as a method. Yeah. What would you tell that person who is facing doubts about, let's pick a topic. They're facing doubts about two things. Let's just say the reliability of the Bible and their own relationship with Jesus. Where should that person start? Yeah. That's a great question, because I actually don't think Christians should be afraid of honest doubt. And the way that I would identify or define honest doubt is that I, I, I actually go so far as to say I think honest doubt is a necessary part of spiritual growth. Like, I would question the maturity of a Christian if you've never questioned, why do I believe the Bible is the Word of God? Why do I believe Jesus was raised from the dead? And so I think there's a sense in which honest doubt is necessary because it, let's just be honest about it. If we don't question and, and make these beliefs our own because we're really convinced they're true, there's no difference between somebody growing up in the evangelical church and maybe somebody growing up as a Mormon. You know, if they're told never to question, then, then I mean, there's contradictions there. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. Yes. And we need to investigate what's true. And so doubt is not the opposite of faith. I think that's the mistake a lot of Christians make is they think that if you doubt something, it means you're a weak Christian or that your faith is weak. No, actually think about what doubt is. You have to actually believe something in order to doubt it. And so I think it's perfectly fine to go on a truth quest when it comes to some of the things that that you may have always been told you believe, especially if there's a wound there. Yeah. If somebody has been through, uh, let's say, an experience of spiritual abuse, which is, I, I think is pretty rampant right now. We're seeing a lot of mm -hmm. scandals come to light. And I I say, praise God, shine the light. Let's yeah. let's clean house, right? Um, but but we can't throw the gospel out because of an experience like that, which is what I think the deconstruction movement wants you to do. If you've been through spiritual abuse, it's like, well, hey, they'll tie up all sorts of things together and maybe conflate the abuse of a doctrine with the doctrine itself being abusive. And so um, for the person who's questioning those things, I would say, go on a truth quest. Absolutely. Don't be afraid of the evidence. Don't be afraid to investigate your questions, because if we push those things down and we just tell ourselves, well, I'm just going to believe because I'm going to like, you know, I don't know, dig my heels in and believe it. There's going to come a, a fa another faith crisis. You, you have to be able to be open about those questions and to acknowledge the, the pain point. Because there are people who have deconstructed because they had a, a hyper legalistic environment they grew up in, or perhaps they witnessed a lot of hypocrisy in the church environment they grew up in. And so my encouragement to them would be don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, discover what's true and discard what's false. But in holding to what's true, you're going to find the cure and the answer for those things as well, because God hates abuse yeah. and God hates hypocrisy. Jesus talked a lot about hypocrisy. So it, it doesn't all need to be tied together in the same ball of yarn and, and tossed out. Yes, that's exactly right. You know, scripture tells us to test all things, hold fast to that, which is good. And that's just a great encouragement. I think there's a lot of people uh, who will look at the church and see hypocrisy. But no matter what field we're in, like I'm in medical sales, no matter what industry, 
there are bad decisions and what we might say hypocritical or perhaps inconsistencies. And in this journey with our relationship with Christ, uh, we may not know everything, but we take steps towards the light. Is you know, faith is not blind. It's not a step of faith into the darkness, but it's a step towards the light of what God has already revealed. Let's talk, Elisa, maybe about um, some of the biggest threats. If I was to ask you, what do you think are some of the biggest threats to the gospel this year, right now in 2022? What do you what are you hearing uh, from your from your audience and just observing in our culture? Well, I, I think that I, you know, people are always wanting to know what's the biggest threat and it's, and that's going to change, right? That's going to be constantly in flux because as, uh, you know, we, we see things morph and change, they get more clever, they get more nuanced, but I think it, it would be pretty fair to say right now that the, that the biggest threat would be the, the actual process of deconstruction. And I'll, and the reason I say that is because deconstruction is really kind of like a vehicle people get into that can lead them all, all kinds of different places. Hmm. You can deconstruct into progressive Christianity. You can deconstruct into atheism or new age or some sort of broad spiritual, but not religious type of category. Hmm. So it's sort of the method by which people are leaving the gospel. And so I think that's probably the biggest threat is just this, this vehicle of deconstruction. Because again, as we're defining it, we're not talking about picking apart all your beliefs and just, and holding fast to what is true. We, we say, do that, always do that. But I don't think that's what deconstruction is. Deconstruction is a, an, it's an exit. It's yeah. not uh, a, just a neutral platform by which you figure out what you believe is true or false. So let me just go through, if maybe just you can give me just quick answers to some of these here. And I'm going to pick up some of the biggest objections. And some of these are, okay. comp, you know, so um, if I was to ask you the question here, why should I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way? That seems very narrow minded. What would you tell me on that? Well, because he said he was. And I would anchor that in the resurrection. You know, if he just was some guy who came along and said, I'm the only way, you know, you could discard that and say, well, lots of people have said things like that, or they might have claimed to be d divine in this sense or another sense. But Jesus proved everything he claimed about himself to be true with the resurrection. So the guy who raises himself from the dead sort of gets to make that claim. Yeah. And um, and yeah. as you know, as you know, in the apologetics world, we're not just saying we're not making an appeal to the case of, well, the Bible says so. Therefore, you know, it's true that he was resurrected. There's evidence outside the Bible that could lead you to conclude that this guy, Jesus, actually was raised from the dead in the first century. So that's my short answer. But of course, you, great, know, you yeah. got to dig into the evidence. Like, yeah, Absolutely. And there's more of that in your book here, Another Gospel. You talk about the creeds of 1 Corinthians 15 and go into details there. So I highly recommend. By the way, with our audience, if you're listening, you have we may have time for a question or two. Uh, you just, Elisa, you did um, a, a video I saw about this new movie out, Redeeming Love. Maybe you could just give us a quick answer. Should Christians see the movie Redeeming Love? <laughs> well, I'm only laughing because I've gotten myself in a heap of mess over this, but I I mean, I'm just looking at it like, I, I stand by what I said. So let me just give a little background. I, I've not read the book Redeeming Love and I've not seen the movie. So when I make a commentary and when I made a com I made a video on my on my YouTube channel about giving reasons why I'm choosing not to see the movie. Um, and my commentary has to do with the movie. I, I can't really comment on the book. I have friends who read it. I'm getting mixed reviews. I have no idea. I've not read the book. So, you know, I can't really speak to it. But I did watch the trailer of the movie. I read several synopses of the movie. And there's a couple of reasons that I'm I'm choosing not to see it. Um, number one, I just am allergic to Bible adaptations. This The, the book, which the movie is based on, uh, if you go to the official description on Amazon or in Christian book, it says it's a retelling of the story of Hosea and Gomer. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, of course, the movie is this big it's it's a love story. It's a romance. Um, it's it's very romanticized. And then there are a couple of what I'm reading are described as not extremely graphic sensual scenes, but uh, certainly graphic in the sense where when I'm reading people's justifications of the scenes, I'm like, 
okay, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think I'll tell you the main reason, Dave, that that I'm choosing not to see it is when I watch the trailer, I'm seeing something that's really appealing to my fallen fleshly nature. Mm -hmm. What I'm seeing is this perfect man, perfectly curated love scenes, this long, slow burn of a story where he's perfectly patient, perfectly loving. And mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to talk about what's emotional porn for women, you're looking at it with what mm -hmm. I saw in that trailer. And so I'm just, I mean, just being honest, I think that it's something that would not, <laughs> if I saw it, it's not going to make me fall on my face and worship Christ. And being that it's marketed as something based on a biblical story, um, to me, that just seems a little bit on the side of uh, something that's a little more blasphemous. Yeah. So, but no, listen, not everybody's agreed with me. There's been a lot of pushback. Yeah. So, well, um, I appreciate your, you, you know, reasons. no, I appreciate you giving your reasons. And there's often things like this that, I mean, I've seen a lot of shows that I'm not proud of. And, and even with our church, we're doing, um, you know, this, this kind of this fast and my wife and I decided we were watching a show and we're like, you know what, let's just take a break from that. Yeah. But I think it's even harder when it's spiritualized, right? When people yeah. uh, use Christian language to justify it. And then it, it has these subtle messages uh, where really there's a whole historical uh, context of that. And you talk about that in one of your videos and on your website about Hosea. So I encourage everybody to go to Alisa uh, Childers' website and also her YouTube channel to hear yeah, more about that. Yeah, could I just that. say, could I say one sure. quick thing about that? So what this has done for me, though, which I'm so thankful for, is the Lord has just really um, opened up the whole world of Hosea to me. So I've been, I've read mm -hmm. Hosea several times. I've done a medium level study of it, but I'm doing a deep dive. And that was one of the, the main, now I wouldn't necessarily choose to not see a movie if it's not an accurate adaptation. I would use discernment and figure out, well, you know, what did they get right? What did they get wrong? But um, the movie is not anything like what the book of Hosea is about. Yeah. And so I'm going to be blogging through Hosea. So if people want to join me on that journey, go to elisachilders.com, click the blog tab, scroll down a little bit, and you'll see a little post that says, here's why I'm not seeing redeeming love. And then Hosea studies start here. And every time I make a new post, I'll link it there to that. So it'll all be in one place, but it's just the, the, the insights and the what we learn about the nature and character of God in Hosea is so beautiful. And uh, and so I'm just really learning a lot and loving studying it. So I'd love to invite especially women to join me on that journey of just learning the real story. That is that is fantastic, because um, sometimes in, in my own life, I, I have the goal to read a whole Bible in a year and I go through the New Testament, I go through a good portion of the Old Testament, but sometimes these little books in the Old Testament, like Hosea, have a beautiful story. So that is wonderful that you're doing that. In closing, I just want to ask a couple of questions, and it may be for me and some of my friends, what advice would you give to someone who is just getting started and wanting to learn more about apologetics? Of course, I would say, everybody, you need to get this book, Another Gospel, but where else should they go? Well, I think just, you know, picking up a podcast is a great way, you know, we're, we're busy in 2022 or we, it's hard to like sit down and actually open a book and take the time to read. I get that, but thank God we have so many options in the, in the digital world. So there are podcasts and audiobooks. I would recommend some of those names I mentioned before, crossexamined.org. Um, the, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist podcast over there is great. The Stand to Reason podcast is great. Jay Werner Wallace has a great podcast. There's just so many wonderful resources. Um, and then as far as books go, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist is a great starter apologetics book, along with uh, Cold Case Christianity by Jay Werner Wallace. Just maybe pick up one book. Don't feel overwhelmed. You don't need to be overwhelmed. Just read it. And if something in one of those books excites you or it's something you want to learn more about, or if it provokes another question, just go on a journey of, of just engaging that question, that one thing that pops up. You don't have to know everything, but just learn new things about why you believe what you believe. And it's, it's a fun journey to go on. That's exciting. You have uh, great guests on your show. I've, I've watched a number of episodes. And uh, what about this? I'm new at podcasting. I, you know, have a small following. I want to grow in this area. There's other people during this whole COVID who want to, uh, you know, go on YouTube and express their ideas. Maybe it's apologetics, uh, maybe it's theology. Any just broad ideas for for people who want to be teachers, who want to be communicators. You have yeah. a huge. How many subscri uh, subscribers do you have? Isn't it like a hundred thousand uh, or something? 
It's yeah, I think we're at about one thirty-five, something like wow. that. Yeah, amazing. And so, that only happened about- since COVID. Like COVID started. That's when I started the YouTube channel. Wow. So. Yeah. Um, I guess advice I would have is consistency. I think being very consistent uh, to provide your listeners and viewers with content that's going to be relevant to them. So I think it's really important to decide who your audience is. Are you talking to Christians? Are you talking to non-Christians? Are you trying to persuade people? Or are you trying to fortify what people, uh, you know, give them reasons for why they're not crazy for believing what they do? I think these are very important questions to ask yourself when you start producing content. Because, for example, my podcast is mostly for the church. It's mostly for Christians who are not progressive Christians, but they want information about progressive Christianity. So I'll do book reviews for them and I'll have expert guests on that can maybe speak to one of the challenges brought in by progressive Christians. But I have friends who uh, in, engage in the realm of progressive Christianity, but they do it more. Their podcast is more about trying to persuade progressive Christians. And so they'll have progressive Christians on as guests and they'll do uh, dialogues and debates. So you have to decide who you are. Who, what are you That's wanting great. to give people? And who's your audience? If you're if you're talking to skeptics, you're gonna you're gonna frame things a little bit differently than if you were talking to people who are already on the same page with you. And I think we need all of that. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people will say to me, "How come you only ever have people you agree with on your podcast?" And I just kind of want to say because that's my format. You know, right. my format is to give the church who already we all believe kind of this core things reasons why you don't have to go believe this. Here's why there's good reason to believe this is true. Um, But I have friends who do the other, and I have done the other on other people's podcasts. I've had dialogues with progressive Christians on other podcasts. But I I think keep, so your audience knows exactly what to expect from you as far as, you know, we're going to always be in this sort of little realm of of how we're going to approach content and and, uh, and whatnot. So that would be my first piece of advice. And stay in the word, stay in the word. Yes, absolutely. With all these people falling away, it's it's important just to stay in the word. And uh, I'm sure I will be watching your your uh, YouTube channel. And where would you tell your audience to go? Uh, your website, lisachilders.com, correct? That's right. So elisachilders.com. You'll find links to everything there. But my, uh, like you said, my probably my, big, my biggest platform right now, well, I think my biggest platform is the audio podcast. But okay. uh, so that's the Elisa Childers podcast. But uh, on YouTube, search my name, Elisa Childers. Uh, you can go to Instagram. I'm I'm engaging a lot more on Instagram these days. I'm going to start doing some Instagram lives more as I blog through Hosea and talk through that. So yeah, I'm kind of everywhere except Twitter. I'm not on Twitter. I don't have the uh, the emotional spiritual bandwidth for Twitter. So <laughs> you well, just got to draw your boundaries where you have to. <laughs> well, very good. And I would just in closing just encourage small groups. Uh, this is a great resource. Uh, don't just read it alone. You can't. You can read it alone. But also, if you're a believer a believer, you're meeting with other Christians, encourage them to get that book and take a few weeks to study that together. Also, Lisa, you mentioned uh, you have another book you're working on right now. What is that called? Right. So I have a book coming out this next fall, and it's called Live Your Truth and Other Lies, uh, Exposing Popular Deceptions That Make Us self anxious, self-obsessed and exhausted. And so that's already written and that's coming out in the fall, but I just signed a contract for a third book that I'm going to be co-writing with Tim Barnett of Red Pen Logic. And you can check out his Mm -hmm. YouTube channel and it's going to be about deconstruction. Wow. That is fantastic. Well, I look forward to reading both of those and Elisa, thank you so much for joining the show. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was fun. Thanks, Dave.